So here we have a collection of common aerosol cans, or spray cans. Um, they all have a similar function. There is some type of material in it that you would like to be able to spray. To achieve this, all of these cans are under pressure. They have a propellant in them. And then they have the actual stuff you would like to spray. With the exception of the, the air duster, we'll get to him later, um, all of these guys have straws or tubes that come down to the bottom so that when you press the trigger, the repellent, which exists uh, as a gas at the top, will push down, um, puts the liquid under pressure so that it will be shoved out the straw, up the straw, and out of your container. A variety of propellants are used. Uh, on these cans, you will now typically see something that says no CFCs on them. Uh, CFC refers to chlorofluorocarbon which was a very common propellant that was used for quite some time, also uh, used as a refrigerant, but because of environmental regulations due to its ozone-depleting properties, you, you typically don't see it anymore, it's no longer used. Uh, a variety of other propellants are used. In fact, among these cans that you see here, there are different propellants used between them. Um, CFCs were useful because they were non-flammable. Some of the propellants in these are not, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. First up, we have something like spray paint. You see spray paint quite a lot. It's very convenient. The can, if you were to actually look at the tiny block of massive text on the back, will not actually list all the ingredients of the paint. It will list some things on there, specifically VOCs, or volatile organic compounds. These are organic compounds, which is a compounds based on carbon, that are volatile. Now, volatile does not mean they explode, though some of them do. Volatile refers to their having a high vapor pressure, which means if this stuff were sitting out, it would evaporate. A lot of it would vaporize, um, and it would get into the air as a gas. This is important because in the event that you have a solvent or something that is toxic, and it is evaporating, it gets into the air, and you breathe it, and it's, it's much worse than if it were just sitting there as a liquid or in some other state. So the spray paint will list on the back its, its various VOCs, and there's a tremendous number of safety warnings on it saying you shouldn't use this indoors because the VOCs, among other things, could accumulate. Now, like uh, most of our cans, uh, there's a propellant used. The propellant will typically when you're holding the can upright the gas phase of the propellant is at the top of the can so that it pushes the material down um, and up the tube and out. Because the gas is at the top when you're holding it upright you get paint. If you were to invert the can all of the liquid material, the actual paint that you're interested in would go to the other side so the straw that is at the bottom of the can is now surrounded by gas. This is useful if you want to clean the tip of the can if you hold the can upside down and let the, the paint sink to the bottom and then squeeze, no paint will come out, but you will get a discharge of propellant. Uh, since the propellant doesn't contain any paint, it will blast out any of the propellant left in the tip. So that if you're going to store the can and you don't want the paint to dry in the tip, you can do that. Next up, we have something like WD-40. Uh, WD-40 is commonly used for squeaks, uh, to lubricate um, hinges, joints, this sort of thing. Now, it's interesting because uh, WD-40 is water displacement 40, or the 40th attempt to make a water displacing uh, material or substance. To make it sprayable, there are other things added to it. So when you spray the WD-40, the thing that actually stays behind and prevents your squeaking and provides lubrication for your moving parts is not all that came out of the nozzle. In addition to the propellant, which becomes gas and, and blows um, enters the atmosphere and goes away. You also have other stuff to actually make the WD-40 you're interested in less viscous. The actual material that prevents your stuff from squeaking and provides lubrication is kind of thick and viscous. Well, that wouldn't work so well to put through a nozzle in a spray can. So there are um, lighter weight hydrocarbons uh, that are more volatile that uh, are used to dissolve the actual part of the WD-40 you're interested in so that you can shove it out of the can and spray it onto things. This is important to note because if you have uh, an enclosed space and you happen to be using a lot of this, the WD-40 that prevents your squeaking stays on the part, but the lighter weight hydrocarbons will get into the air. And if you have enough of these running around, 
Um, you can get dizzy, uh, headaches, nausea, this sort of thing. It's, it's not a fun time. Um, normally, with, with normal use of the, of the WD-40, you're not going to run into this, but if you're doing, um, let's say you're using this to provide uh, coolant lubrication for drilling, and you're doing this quite a lot in confined spaces, you can, you can start to get sick from uh, prolonged exposure to it. Uh, next up, we have some hairspray. Um, the hairspray is interesting because the hairspray is the only one of these that actually has a complete ingredients label. Now, here in the United States, we have the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA. And most people assume that things like this would be regulated by the FDA, and indeed that would be the organization to regulate it if they could. Uh, the FDA actually does not regulate cosmetic products of which this hairspray is considered. Because of the FDA's limited ability to regulate any kind of cosmetic, this means that there are no required tests that a company must perform on a product before taking it to market. While they're required to, to declare that they're safe, they're not actually required to do any testing. And any testing that the company may choose to do, they don't have to provide the results of those tests to the FDA. However, it does have an ingredients label. Something about ingredients. Ingredients are typically listed or required to be listed in order of prevalence in the material. So typically by weight, the first thing on your list will be the thing that occurs the most, and so on and so forth, until you get down to the contents that comprise less than 1% of the material. At that point, they don't have to be listed by how much of the product they make up. So anything below 1% can be listed in any order. So this means that the last thing on the last set of items on a product label are not necessarily the things that are the least prominent in the product because if they're all below 1%, they could be rearranged. Now, you would also think that well, clearly uh, this hairspray shouldn't explode or anything like that. Well, it is quite flammable. There is a warning label on it that indicates that it is quite flammable. The number one ingredient of this particular hairspray is water, but the number two is dimethyl ether, which is very flammable. It is. It has a boiling point of, I think, negative 20-something degrees Celsius. And so it, it is a gas in a normal uh, environment, normal atmospheric pressure and temperature, and very, very flammable. Um, from a hazardous materials perspective, you'll see the, the diamonds that have uh, the different numbers in them, and then the red portion of the diamond is for flammability. They're rated from one to four, one being the least flammable, four being the most. Something like gasoline would be a three. Dimethyl ether is a four. It has the highest classification of flammability. It is the second item listed on this particular product. The third is denatured alcohol. When we say denatured alcohol, what we really mean is conventional drinking type alcohol, ethyl alcohol, that has some type of adulterant added to it to make it either poisonous or taste horrible, basically to prevent you from buying it for the purposes of drinking. Um, it is also quite flammable. It is also a solvent. Um, the dimethyl ether is a solvent as well. Um, but they are the number two and number three items listed. Uh, below that, you get into various copolymers, which are basically the building blocks of plastics that are what make the product actually work. Lastly, we have a, a a spray. Lastly, we have a spray duster, or occasionally some people refer to this as a can of air. The air duster is unique in that it does not have a straw that goes to the bottom, because the air duster wants the gas portion of the propellant. In fact, what makes the air duster unique among these, in addition to not having a straw that goes to the bottom, is that it only contains propellant. It doesn't actually contain air. Sometimes we call them air dusters, but when we think of air, we think of an atmosphere of mostly nitrogen and 20-some-odd and, and percent oxygen. Well, there's, there's no nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide. None of that is in this can. Um, this is difluoroethane. Difluoroethane is not a CFC, um, as they prominently tell you on the can. It does, however, have the unique property that you can compress it a lot. So when you get these cans, if you shake them, you can hear that there's a liquid in there. And that is the propellant. The propellant exists as both a liquid and a gas in the container. When you squeeze the trigger, the gas portion of the propellant that's at the top of the can uh, escapes and goes out and dusts your stuff. 
When this happens, the equilibrium between the liquid form of the propellant and the gas form of the propellant is upset. So some of the liquid propellant evaporates and becomes gas so that you keep a pressurized gas section of propellant in the can. Uh, that's what allows it to operate. We use things that aren't air because they compress much better and they're, they're not flammable and they do not provide an oxidizer. Because there is no straw, you're getting the gas from the top of the can. Many people have noticed that if you turn these cans upside down and squeeze the trigger, a liquid comes out. What you're seeing is the liquid form of the propellant. Normally you wouldn't want that to escape. The liquid that comes out will almost immediately uh, vaporize. The boiling point of difluoroethane is, is well below atmospheric temperature. So when it comes out, it will vaporize. Now, you can use this to cooling effect because it evaporates so fastly, the process of evaporation will absorb heat. So it has uh, a cooling effect on the environment around it. Now, even though this contains no air and wouldn't, wouldn't therefore be flammable, you wouldn't want to expose this to any type of flame. It is a compound containing fluorine, and exposure to high temperatures could cause it to decompose into other fluorine compounds, and that would not be a good day. If anyone has any questions, uh, let me know in the comments.